Right now we have three different exhibitions, which are all selections from the permanent collection. So one highlights the classical world. That's always on view, but this is a new iteration of it, um, covering two galleries rather than just the one. Um, that's our classical Greek, Roman, Etruscan artwork. Um, the gallery that we're standing in right now is an exhibition also from the permanent collection called Picturing Land and Sea. Uh, it's a selection mostly of paintings, but a number of works on paper um, of landscapes and seascapes. Um, some quite realistic, like the one behind me, others a little bit uh, more abstract. Um, this exhibition is about 20 works in all and spans over a century. So we see a lot of different movements in our history, a lot of different ways that artists are perceiving um, and, and portraying the natural world, both land and sea. Uh, and then the third of these permanent collection exhibitions is called Mid-Century Modernist Works, beginning a little bit before World War II and going up into the 60s and 70s. Um, most of these works are done by American artists. This is a time in art history um, following the immigration of a lot of European artists to New York City in particular, uh, which gives rise to what a lot of people would call a purely American uh, art movement, abstract expressionism. So we see some abstract expressionist works, we also see some post-abstract expressionist works in that show. So the work behind me is uh, a wonderful painting by a woman named Carolyn Brady and it looks almost like a photograph. That's no accident. In fact, this is a watercolor painting which makes it all the more remarkable because if you've ever worked with watercolor, you know it doesn't lend itself so well um, to, to high levels of detail like, like we see here. Um, this is a painstakingly done work that's, that's done by projecting photographic images onto the watercolor paper and then very, very slowly in a very meticulous way using the watercolor paint to, to create this very realistic vision of the world. The painting behind me now is, is called Bathers on the Rocks. It was painted in 1935 by a Russian-born American painter named Abraham Wachowicz. It's very different, I think, from the painting that we were just looking at that almost looked photographic. Um, it was so realistic. This is a much more abstracted version uh, of what Mr. Wachowicz saw before him. And it, it almost recalls Matisse and other painters like that. Now we're standing in the entrance to the Classical World exhibition. Uh, and this is one of the most remarkable sculptures that we own. This is what's known as a Roman grave altar. It's carved of solid marble uh, made in the middle of the second century AD. And I like that this was an actual living person who lived in ancient Rome, um, or, or near ancient Rome. We think actually he, he was from Ostia, which is the port town of ancient Rome. But you see him really looking out at you, and it's almost as if you're, you're in a conversation with him. His name was Lucius Caltilius Diodumanus, and we learn from the inscription that he died at only 35 years old, um, and that he was a former slave who had earned his freedom and his former master, after he died, had this wonderful monument created for him. One of the reasons that we decided to highlight our permanent collection in, in these various exhibitions is that we're coming up on our fifth birthday in this building. And we really wanted to highlight not only the building, but also the museum and the artwork that the museum owns. And I think that this vase here is, is a great place to talk about that because this this vase was the very first piece of artwork that the museum purchased back in 1981. It's what's known as an Attic or Athenian black figure column crater. And that's a long name. Basically what it means is that the figures are in black, hence black figure, um, and a column crater is a mixing vessel. The ancient Greeks didn't drink their wine straight the way that we do, they mix it with water. And in order to do that, they needed a, a, a big bowl like this with a wide open mouth. And some of these figures alongside we can identify as, as deities. So this is Dionysus, the god of wine, carrying his drinking cup. This is Apollo uh, carrying his lyre. And this all suggests that this is not just an ordinary procession, but the wedding procession of Peleus and Thetis. 
who are the mythical parents of Achilles, the very famous hero whom many people have heard of. Uh, but the reason that I say this is a first in, in Greek mythology is because at that wedding there, there was a bit of a problem that it was this big important wedding and all of the gods and goddesses were invited except for one and her name was Eris which translates to strife and it was a big mistake not to invite strife to the wedding. She then came to the wedding and tossed in the golden apple that many of you have probably heard of that is inscribed to the fairest or to the most beautiful um, which led to the judgment of Paris, uh, Paris selecting Aphrodite as the most beautiful of all the goddesses, which then eventually leads to the Trojan War. So on this one vase, which started the Tampa Museum of Arts collection of Greek and Roman antiquities, we also see the story that started one of the most important um, epics in, in Greek mythology. So in this exhibition, mid-century modernist works, we, ha we have works um, not only on the walls, but we also have a number of three-dimensional works, and I'm standing next to one of them here. It's by a sculptor named Harry Bertoya, who's, who's fairly well known. And this is a sculpture that doesn't have a title, but it's, it's a type of sculpture that he did a number of that are called tonal sculptures, or sound sculptures. And the reason for that is that you can see these that almost look like uh, willows or reeds. And this is made of brass, and we, we don't want any of our visitors to touch it, but if you stand closely and just look very closely, you can see them just wavering ever so slightly, just from the air currents that are caused by people walking through the galleries and by the air conditioning and, and so on. Um, and if there were a larger breeze, this would actually create a sound, and hence the name a sound sculpture or a tonal sculpture. The works in this corridor are all by a sculptor named C. Paul Genowine. Uh, you can see five of them here, but the museum in fact owns thousands of works done by Genowine, who after his death uh, in 1978 left by bequest virtually everything that was in his studio. And that's thanks partly to his generosity and partly to that of his son, uh, Jim Genowine, who was for many years on, on our board of trustees, and, and Jim's wife Joan, and um, the family continues to be involved with the museum and generous to the museum, so we're grateful for that. Uh, but what we see here are a number of, of finished works by Genowine, um, as I said, active in the beginning of the 20th century and, and throughout uh, much of the middle of the 20th century. Uh, Genowine spent time early in his life in Rome at the American Academy and was quite influenced, as you can see, by Italian artists and by classical artists. And so we see a lot of classicizing uh, motifs in his work. Um, and that's something that was popular during the middle of the 20th century, sort of combining neoclassicism with, with the Art Deco movement. Um, Genowine did a lot of sculptures like this, but also larger commissions some of which you can see in New York City, um, outside Rockefeller Center, for example. You can see them at the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. Um, you can see it at, on the pediment of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So Genowine is a very well-known sculptor, and, and we're fortunate to have so much of his work here in Tampa. <laughs>